这附近的车位比较紧。Essentially, this um, this work uh, uh, has been carried out in three different places. So, uh, for what concerns the structural determination, so material modeling and so on, this has been mostly carried out by uh, people in uh, in, uh, Cambridge, in London, so to speak, uh, Richard Needs and uh, co-workers, and uh, part of it uh, in the group of Yaming Ma. And uh, the the part that is mostly what we have done in Paris is the. A study of superconductivity and harmonicity, and how an harmonicity can affect the crystal structure in the system, an harmonicity and quantum effects. So um, these are the, uh, the the paper that you can you you, you can read uh, if you are interested in the subject. And uh, for what concerns our work, there are many papers on the subject. But there is. And then everything, all this was possible due to a methodological development that allows to treat um, the, the the protons of the hydrogen. Fully quantum mechanical. So, considering that this object they do have a wave function, and uh, that will allow that has allowed us to, to go substantially beyond current state of the art first principle calculations, with, with the result that are very very. Sorry. So, uh, just let me um, tell you something that was simple at the beginning. So, um, don't suppose that you want to understand superconductivity, phonomagnetic superconductivity, a first qualitative approach comes from this very simple phenomenological equation that is the Macmillan equation. It tells you what is the superconducting critical temperature in a metal at low temperature when it becomes superconducting. And uh, this equation that is phenomenological but qualitatively reproduces fairly well the trend of different superconductors, even if not completely justified from the principle, gives anyway a good idea of what are the key ingredients that you have to take. And there are three parameters, three key ingredients. One is the electron form interaction lambda. So one is the phonon frequency. Uh, it means the uh, phonon frequency of the mode that are strongly coupled to the electrons. And the third one is the Coulomb branch. Why these three key parameters? Because what do you need to make superconductivity? First of all, to make superconductivity, you need Cooper pairs. You need enough Cooper pairs or enough electrons. And this is the density of state at the Fermi level that enters the definition of the electron form. Then, of course, you need that your electron are strongly coupled to the phonon. So it means that when you displace an ion, then the electron follow, follow this ion. And this is the deformation potential. So it tells you how much the potential felt by electron when you displace an ion. Uh, how big is it? And then, of course, uh, if, the, if the phonons are highly energetic, then uh, superconductivity can be more or less with high, high 
higher or lower DC. And uh, if you look, so the electron phono coupling depends on the phono frequency square, 1 over phono frequency square. So it means that uh, in this equation, here in the prefactor there is the phono frequency, so the best, the larger the electron phono frequency is, the best is for the prefactor. However, lambda the electron phono interaction is suppressed by a large electron phono frequency. So there is a trade-off between this exponential and actually the prefactor. And this trade-off is not easy to understand because the two things are interplay between them because also the electron phono coupling, the differential potential determines also the phono frequency. So it's not so easy to predict why a phono magnetic superconductor, superconductor will, will have high DC. Then there is a third parameter which is the Coulomb repulsion. So the Coulomb repulsion, you want, in a superconductor you want to form Cooper pairs, so you want to pair to electron. If the Coulomb repulsion is too big, the electron will not pair. So this is the third key ingredient that enters this equation. So the point is that it's not obvious what do we have to maximize. Okay, let's minimize Coulomb repulsion. This is not easy to do, but let's do what should we do? Large phono frequency, large electron phono coupling, of course, this is not obvious. Ideally, this large and this large would be great, but it's not possible to do this as large as we want and this as large as we want because this will decrease. So what does nature? So let's take two examples uh, of uh, existing in nature, in which nature has decided either to maximize the phono energy or to maximize the electron phono energy. This is magnesium diboride that score a very good 39 Kelvin. And in this case, the nature has, has chosen to, to, uh, here the, uh, to take an omega log, so an average of the phonon frequency of 24.7 millimeter, uh, with the highest form, with, with, with a strongly phonon mode at 64 millimeter, which is the EPG mode. But an electron phonon cap that is intermediate. So this electron phonon cap is actually a pure number. So you can compare different superconductors problem because it's just a pure number and uh, and, um, <coughs> and and this score a very good 39 Kelvin however if you take lead which is some more superconducting most of the time nature has decided to maximize lambda but this paying uh, the price of a very low form of energy and we have, we have a very low form of energy essentially because lead is heavy and here you have a much lower temperature so um, Looking at this small, two small example, Ashcroft many years ago proposed that maybe if we manage to metallize hydrogen, hydrogen has naturally very high energy modes. So if you metallize and we have a very large electron coupling, due to these modes, we will have large electron coupling and large from energy. You have to take into account that when you metallize an insulator and you have electron phonon coupling that comes into play, electron phonon coupling strongly soften the phonon frequency. And when the electron phonon coupling is too large, the phonon will become imaginary and you will have a charity wave of pure failure distortion of pure in your system. So it's not obvious that the system can sustain a very large electron phonon coupling. However, if you start from very high energy mode in the insulator, then you can probably sustain a very large electron phonon coupling. This was the key idea of Ashcroft. However, the, the main problem is that, as you know better than me, you need at least, but probably much more than 300 GPA to metallize hydrogen. So this is not so easy to do. And uh, during years, you know better than me that this was considered very low at, uh, for the radial regulation, and now we are always going to higher, 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 higher pressure. But actually, um, uh, things changed a bit uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the last two years, so this was 2005, uh, fine, end of 2005, I think, well, um, due to Michael F., uh, to Mikhail Eremet, uh, in which um, he, he performed the following the following experiment in which he loaded a diamond ambient cell with H2S uh, and then he applied pressure. So let's look a bit after the details uh, of how we apply pressure. And when he applied pressure, he ended up uh, first in a metallic state and then in a superconducting state. So this is the superconducting state, as you can see here. And uh, raising the pressure of the superconducting state keeps, keeps uh, uh, arrived to very high temperature, critical temperature, almost under and then there is a second way, second path, I will show you in more details, that seems to metallize a second phase that has even at higher uh, superconducting temperature, around 100 Kelvin, 105 is the maximum. Make that a small exercise, take this line and take it here, as you can see this line is here. Now let's look what is the difference between the two. 
Before I go on, I would like to say that this is some kind of a joke, but this is room temperature superconductivity in at least one place on Earth. <laughs> it's Boston, Boston Station. But, uh, <laughs> and, and not always, once in a while. And uh, the second thing I would like to stress to this is uh, we always look for nature, when we try to publish on nature to use superlative, there's a nature with a word that is conventional, that is not so common. Now let's look a bit at, a bit more at these two at these two pictures. So uh, I try to reproduce carefully the, what was written in the two papers. You probably know it is better than I do. So the, here uh, the cell is loaded at 200 k, 200 k, pressurized up to 100 GPA, then cool it down for, to 4 k to the I mean, cool it down down to 4 k. Then heat it again at 200 k. Then pressure is increased. And so on. Uh, if you do a uh, different thing, so load at 200 K, pressurize above 140 at GPA, heat from temperature, and then cool down, you end up with different things. So this seems to suggest, this is some kind of a need in it because you need more. This seems to suggest that you have two phase, but this is the stable one. Huh? And as you can see, totally different behavior TC versus pressure. The stable phase uh, pressure is reduced. Uh, TC is increased as you reduce the pressure. In this phase, TC increases as you increase the pressure. Huh? Totally different. And um, the, uh, the Ethereum, uh, the same path, uh, show similar behavior. So you have also uh, the isotope effect, which is available in the system. Now, let's see uh, if, if we can understand this details, this experimental details. Then there has been a more recent paper, which I think is a very beautiful experiment. I, I, I try to see if I produce, if I explain to you carefully. But this is essentially a way to do most power spectroscopy with, with, with Pulse at synchrotron condition. And um, um, uh, the point is that you want to measure a uh, Meissner uh, effect uh, in the system. And uh, so they prepared this diamond lambic cell in which you have uh, a tin foil, ethan foil, of actually the 119 isotope of tin. And everything all around that is H2S. Uh, and then you have parts of synchrotron radiation and magnetic field. And so uh, um, essentially, normally, if you are not in a superconducting phase, uh, you, you, you can detect the quantum beats between the splitting of the one half and three half uh, nuclear states. Now when you, and, and, and this is the detection of these quantum beats, you can see here. Now if you lower the temperature, then uh, if you are a superconductor, it makes an effect screen any magnetic field, and so you will not see any more the quantum beats. And this is what happened. You don't see any more the quantum beats. So at 150 GPA, this paper, that is, it's the first time I see this kind of uh, measurement, Find it very, very, very impressive from my theoretical point of view. And uh, this demonstrates that there is actually a mass Meissner effect in the system. So, really, it's strong uh, It is, of course, a pity that all these measurements come from a single group. Uh, this would be highly desirable if someone else reproduced this measurement, which are obviously non trivial. And more recently, a uh, second system, which is PH3, joined the cap of a superconductor having to see larger than nitrogen, uh, temper, uh, nitrogen temperature. And uh, as you can see, uh, phosphine, uh, which is the first World War gas used you know, by the Nazi to kill uh, the, during the war, in what's called uh, the mustard gas. You know. And uh, score also 100, K, 100, super, 100 Kelvin superconductor. However, the situation here is very complicated because when you are near, you completely destroy superconductivity. So it seems that superconductivity, of course, is some kind of metastable state. It is very difficult to modelize. So now let's uh, go back up a bit and see what is uh, H2S about uh, under condition. And uh, slowly we will go to see which, which, what happens when you're like that. So H2S at under condition is a gas, a colorless gas. And uh, the molecule is very similar to water molecule. Uh, of course, angle and distance are the difference because sulfur is not oxygen. And um, I would like to so uh, there are many properties of water and uh, H2S, but there is one that in which I am very interested is the stretching and bending vibration. So if you have a molecule like water, you have stretching and bending vibrations, and that uh, uh, you can see here, so stretching on one three and bending in this one, and a uh, typical energy vibration in the molecule are those that you can see here. So stretching vibration around 324 millivy 
and bending vibration around 146 milli. And then, as you can see, there are very high energy, it's trivial because hydrogen is very light, from a frequency is one over square root of the mass, and so they are very uh, energetic. Um, now, uh, what happens if you apply pressure? So, uh, uh, what happens is that at very low pressure, uh, immediately uh, it becomes solid. Uh, solid. And um, it goes through several transformations, and uh, mostly in molecular light phase, most of them in molecular light phase. And the situation for D2S is very similar. And uh, the, this phase has been studied, they are all insulating state, and there are also neat neutral measurements. I don't remember which one are the neutral measurements in this, in this plot. Uh, but there are several phases that are essentially explained by also initial calculations molecular phase, and uh, in all this phase you get the stretching mode that have always high energy, 310 millibit, so close to the energies of the molecule. Okay? Then the first surprise, of course, uh, 27 GPA. 27 GPA, uh, so 2748 GPA is not very clear, depending. So there seems to be dissociations of H2S in, in uh, sulfur plus something else. Not very clear what is at this point of the thought what is uh, uh, something else, it will become clear very soon. Okay. And the second interesting thing is that on 95 GPA, uh, the system becomes metallic. So you have to be careful because is it sulfur or something else that becomes metallic? Because sulfur metallizes on 96 GPA. So, so it could be that sulfur is becoming metallic. Okay. You have to be a bit careful. Or both. So now the first question is what is the something else? And this is where uh, first principle calculation helps. And uh, there has been several calculations, some of them also done by people in collaboration from here. And essentially they all agree uh, uh, that when you don't do not include zero point energy and when you do not include the fact that hydrogen is a quantum object. You don't consider the fact that hydrogen has a wave function. Um, the results are the following. So there are several phase, and there are two metallic phase that in calculation becomes metallic between 111 and 100, above 111. And these two phase are very simple phase. So these are the two phase in the region in which the system has been found. So, and uh, these phase are actually phase of H3. So the dissociation that occurs around 48, is consistent that occurs around 37 GPA in calculation, is consistent with dissociation of H2S in H3S plus S. Okay? So H3S is something that does not exist at all in simulation. If you open the time of set, you will not find any H2S. Okay? And the two structure are actually, uh, so the, the candidate structure for the IPC, so the connectivity, uh, they are you don't see from this, but they are extremely similar. And they differ only by the position of hydrogen. Also, you cannot see from this picture, but you will see this. So the first thing we did is to include zero-point motion. And uh, this is what is called a convex hull. And uh, if you want, um, that in, in this diagram here, you have your, your composition. And you have the formation enthalpy. And the structure that you can um, stabilize are those structures that belong to the convex hull. So, for example, all these points are all structures, but they are metastable, they are not stable. And these are the structures that you can have stable if you neglect zero point motion, so the black picture for so, uh, this structure. So, indeed, uh, this is the H3S structure composition. This is the full uh, sulfur composition, and this is the hydrogen composition. If you include zero point motion, you see that there is a second, uh, a third uh, possible composition, which is HS2, which is less rich in hydrogen. And this HS2 is really borderline at 200 GPA, but becomes possible, clearly possible, to find on 50 GPA. This is, was the first contribution that we gave, actually. A zero-point motion stabilizes an additional structure, and this structure is a, a very complicated structure made of chain and so on, that uh, is interesting also, but at much higher pressure, is also superconducting, but which much lower to see, at least in the calculation. So this was the, the first thing. What is the something else? Is most likely H3S. Okay. From now let's go back to the to the to the measurement of, uh, of 
and Michael Eremetz, and uh, let's put the two candidate structure that we have here and there. Huh? You have to consider that this is F3M, so it has a rhombohedral angle, but the angle is very, very close to a cubic angle. Uh, angle. So it's 0 0.02 degrees, the difference. Okay? So it's very, very small. And uh, mm, the point is that uh, it is tempting to say, okay, this structure is this one, and this structure is this one. However, at the harmonic level, the structure is unstable in this region. So you need something else. You need something more to stabilize the structure. Uh, then there has been diffraction data. There has been diffraction data, always by the same group, and uh, Hermes plus uh, Shimizu. And this diffraction data, they see they see uh, sulfur or hydrogen, and they are consistent with a cubic phase that could be either one or the other, because the cubic angle is very small, the distortion of the cubic angle. But as the two structures, they differ mostly by the hydrogen position, it's not possible to say which one of the two it is. But it is, of course, true that this diffraction pattern is not compatible with the other lower energy structure. Okay. And there is also diffraction that has been done here for the lower uh, pressure and at lower pressure, before the metallization, there is also, of course, controversial. The controversial is uh, some controversial. So now let's look at these structures, these two structures, plotted in a different way. So first of all, the rhomboidal angle is 109.49. The ideal rhomboidal angle for BCC is 109.47. So I can tell you immediately that from the theoretical point of view, if you assume this angle to be 109.47, nothing will change. Okay? Second, let's look at this structure. Look at this structure in details. First of all, it's very beautiful. Everyone likes because it's simple. Theoretician likes because there are not many others per se. Experiment also likes because the fraction is easier. Everyone likes. So you see, the difference is simply that hydrogen is off-centered. So hydrogen here is sitting exactly in the middle. And here it's, it, it, it is sit on one side. Okay. Now, this actually records an old story. So you make a small exercise, you replace sulfur with oxygen, and you go and see in literature, and you see that this is the difference between ice 8 and ice 10 structures that has been studied a lot in the past. And in particular, it has been studied also in simulation, and this is a very old paper, very old, not so old, Michele Pinello. In Ninety-eight, in which, um, with a part integral of the Carlo simulation, they address the crucial role of the fact that the hydrogen has a wave function and then a quantum nature. And um, if you look uh, here, you have the oxygen-oxygen distance against the oxygen, sorry, the oxygen-hydrogen distance against the oxygen-oxygen distance. And this line is the line in which the, the oxygen, the hydrogen, sits exactly in the middle between. Oxygen. So it's the line which ROH is equal to ROO, the distance between the two oxygen divided by H. And when the point is, when the point they are on this line, it means you are in the structure. When they are off of the line, they are in the structure. So if you do standard first principle calculation, you end up with a stabilization of this structure at around 90 or something, GPA. But if you include the quantum nature of the proton, so the fact that the proton do have a wave function, so in a not simple point like chargers, then you, you, you shift to much lower uh, pressure, the stabilization point, by 30 GPA, so minus 30 GPA. So this rings a bell, of course, and tells you that uh, we have the same structure, we have the same system, essentially, hydrogen. This could be important for H3S. And this is what we investigate. But in order to investigate, so I have to do a small theoretical explanation of how we did, because this is really not trivial, so I will skip the most theoretical part. And, uh, if you're interested, you raise your hand. So the point is that you need a way to include, at the same time, uh, quantum effects and uh, an harmonicity far beyond the perturbative level, because you are in a situation, if you go at 130 GPA, you are in a situation where the IM minus 3M structure is unstable, so you cannot do perturbation theory because you have an imaginary form. The correction is bigger by the form itself. So you need a non-perturbative approach to harmonics. And uh, this actually has been studied already in the past. Uh, this is so-called self-consistent harmonic approximation that has been developed for a model of Newtonian by Hutton many years ago. 
But the standard, um, uh, the standard way to implement this uh, is very time consuming because you have to calculate further for further uh, derivative of the total energy, and this is very time consuming. You end up with a lot of power to calculate. So we try to find a more efficient way to, 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 to calculate uh, these effects. Essentially, the goal of this approximation is finding the best free energy that match the anharmonic free energy in a certain class of Hamiltonians. And uh, for example, uh, let's look at this, this more picture. So this is a potential, for example. Now, uh, suppose you have hydrogen. Hydrogen moves a lot. You have this anharmonic potential. But when it moves a lot, it feels also that the, 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 it feels more this part of the potential than this one. And so you can very, good, very well approximate your potential by this harmonic potential. And this is the same here. You have a very harmonic potential, but you can approximate it with a better, almost harmonic potential, at least in this, in this region. And so essentially, how you approximate the free energy, not the potential in the best way. So let me tell, explain you what is the problem. So suppose you have, uh, let's consider, let's forget for one second the electrons. Let's consider the ionic part of the top, simply, because this involves only the ionic mode. So you have uh, um, your Hamiltonian is a kinetic part, kinetic part of the ions plus a potential term. And the problem is this potential term is not harmonic, so it's very difficult to calculate density matrix. Density matrix is exponential minus beta h divided by partition function. Okay? So <coughs> this is expression of the free energy, and you need to calculate the sort of h, which is almost impossible to calculate. We have no analytic, analytical formula. Uh, we have many degrees of freedom because we have and degrees of freedom, so it's different. So now, uh, suppose that we replace this rho h with a rho h that we know in the equation that we can calculate. Of course, in most of the cases, this leads to totally absolute result because you replace one equation. In one equation, you re replace with something different, and you cannot hope to end up with something meaningful. But in this case, you end up with something very meaningful because you have the so called Gibbs Bogolyubov inequality. That tells you this new free energy that you can define simply replaces only the, 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 the density matrix, but not the Hamiltonian, you see, will be variational to the true free energy of your system. So it means that if you, if you choose your, your, your OH in a certain class and then you can minimize the free energy, you will find the best free energy that fits the true free energy. So, you can play the, so this equation here is the same equation that you have there. You can play a bit around with algebra, sum this term, and you end up that your real free energy will be the, your trial free energy, which is the one of uh, a given trial Hamiltonian, uh, plus this term that you need to calculate. So this is the difference between the two potential, or if you want the two Hamiltonian, um, uh, between the real potential and your trial potential. Trial potential, I mean the potential that generates the rho H that I replaced. So uh, now suppose that you can uh, evaluate the stress in some position basis. So you need so let, let's this is integral for all the ionic degrees of freedom. So you need to be able to calculate this object. So this object is nothing else than the total energy of a displaced ion configuration. So this you can calculate with a initial method, or you can calculate with a with force field method, any method that, that will give you total energy. If this is uh, known, then you can, of course, minimize uh, your free energy. What is the advantage of this? The advantage is that uh, uh, if you choose a trial Hamiltonian that is uh, uh, harmonic, uh, then you will get the trial free energy. This is going to be analytical. Rho H is truly Gaussian, and you can generate many ionic configurations distributed as a Gaussian distribution, and this does not require any in this particular software, I can generate millions of this configuration in one second in any portable computer, maybe nowadays even in a telephone. And then uh, what cost is that I have to calculate total energy and also forces to minimize the free energy on this object. And then, given all this configuration, I can replace the, this average by a statistic average for the, all this configuration. And this is what we do. You can show that uh, uh, in this way you capture the quantum mechanical nature of the ions because your rho h is fully quantum mechanical, and uh, you get a very good approximation to the free energy. So, all this, I don't go in, in the details here, but all this was on my own area. It was part of my group and I was a permanent position. It was extremely, uh, in San Sebastian, it was extremely uh, 
talented. So um, let's go back to our case and see what happened. So now we have these two structures. They differ only by uh, one reaction coordinate, which is the position of hydrogen with respect to noise. So let's define this reaction coordinate in such a way that uh, Q equal to 0 means we are in this space, so exactly in the center, and Q equal 1 means we are in the other phase. Okay. So then if you have the total energy of your system at zero temperature, you have a, a static energy contribution. So in, this is the energy contribution that you get from standard admissive regulation, which means uh, the one with no quantum effect of the protein. And then you have a fully quantum mechanical term, uh, that is the so-called vibration energy. Now let's go at 130 GPA. Under, uh, and under, sorry, 50 GPA. 150 GPA means uh, 150 GPA means here is where if you look in zero, so the, the standard of speculation, the structure should be the stable one and not this one. Okay? And indeed what happens is that if you plot only this in zero, you find that the, 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 there is a minimum at Q equal one. So the stable structure is this one and not this one. However, if you consider the vibrational contribution, the quantum mechanical vibrational contribution, these are given by these three points here. Right? And this is a fit to the three points. And if you sum the two, the situation becomes the following. So the IM minus the uh, structure is stabilized only by the quantum effects. So it means that the structure that should have been unstable has become stable at lower pressure. And uh, you can double check it. Uh, you can calculate for different pressure, and you see that even a harder than 30 GPA, uh, this IM minus 3 can phase is stable. stable. So it means that if you look at the phase diagram as a function of pressure, so you, you consider classical, so standard of initial calculation, you find this phase diagram, IM minus 3 m is stable starting from 175 GPA, and the R3M is stable from 90 GPA. Above, uh, I don't remember exactly from which form, at least above above this point. Here there is a competing phase. Then if you put quantum effects, the IM minus 3M phase completely occupy all the phase diagram because here there is a competing structure. So it could be the R3M actually is never existing. And if you take D3S, of course D3S, D has a larger mass, so quantum effects will be smaller. For a very large system, quantum effects are totally irrelevant. For a large mass system, quantum effects are totally irrelevant. And there is a small energy window in which, in which the, the, the R3M could be, could be actually, could exist. Also, you should take a bit, you should be a bit careful. So this, this border of X diagram can be wrong of 5, 10 GPA because this is typical error in calculation. And maybe this is also error in respect. Yes? Does classical mean zero point energy or no zero point energy? Zero point energy is almost irrelevant. Is really the quantum nature of the, the fact that the ions has a, 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 a really a, 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 a wave function and the harmonic effects. Okay? So it's totally different phase diagram, and this is most likely why this went to a high impact publication. And uh, um, so it has the structure is the one that uh, um, is the most important one for superconductivity. Let's look a bit in details of this structure. So first of all, this is a very peculiar structure. Hydrogen is coordinated too. It's not very frequent. So it's happened only a very high pressure. It does not, not happen at 100 conditions. Impossible. Then you have two kinds of uh, vibration. This is what is called the bond stretching, and this is the bond bending. Se second, you, think, you see the, the, the bond distance uh, is 1.4 angstrom, this is typical covalent bond. So we, we, are in a, we are not anymore in any molecular phase. There is no, we are not anymore reminiscent of any molecular phase. This is a covalent bonded solid. Okay. And unfortunately, there are no Raman active modes. So the structure is almost invisible. In particular, hydrogen is almost invisible in this structure. And this is a major problem, of course. Now, um, let's look at electronic structure. So this, this is Michael. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, but how many Raman active modes does the uh, R3M structure? 
LPM I think uh, as maybe one Ramanatic mode. The point is that uh, the LPM with such a small deviation from the IM minus 3M, I do not expect that the intensity of this mode will be significant. So this mode is a kind of soft mode, right? No, I think uh, I think it's a hydrogen mode. Yes, I it's softer, yeah. I, I will come in one second. Much, 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 much softer. I will come in one second to the vibration point. Yes, yes, of course. So you, if you could track it. it would. So uh, this is an electronic flux structure. So it's clear. the answer is clear. Yeah. So this is this is electronic structure, and uh, this calculation done by me, but actually many people did before me. Uh, here I quote uh, Bernstein in particular uh, from our research. That we did. So first thing that you have to know is that the density of state of this object is this one, which is almost the same as magnesium dichloride. So this is density of state of standard metal. So it's not a density of state of a just metallized insulator. This is density of state of standard metal. Okay. Second, this is electronic structure. So forget a bit about this picture. Electronic structure has mixed hydrogen and sulfur character. Look, look at this picture. So in black, you have the real electronic structure. And in red, you have three electron-like electronic structures. So k squared, h bar squared, k squared, you have the two. OK? On this lattice. And you see, they are pretty similar. If you look at the density of state, they are also pretty similar. The density of states, you see, this is square behavior. Huh? But at the Fermi level, they differ. At the Fermi level, you have avoided crossing. Yeah. You have a maximum. And you have also a second maximum that you cannot see because it is outside the high symmetry direction that makes the spikes an extremely narrow spike so that the density of state at the Fermi level is much larger. Okay. Then it's larger than the free electron case. Okay. And this is the 0.32. Of course, density of state at superconductivity. Then you look at the vibrational properties. This is standard harmonic calculation. So, and uh, and uh, what you see, uh, is it's useful to stop some seconds and describe in details the vibrational properties. So first of all, um, you have two separate, essentially two separate uh, bands. So this, these bands are uh, sulfur. You can see here from the decomposed density of state, the green is sulfur. So sulfur is a low energy. There is some hybridization here between sulfur and hydrogen. Okay? And then all this part is hydrogen. And you can separate hydrogen stretching mode, the blue one, and hydrogen bending mode, the black one. Let's look at the, uh, what we had in the molecules that is very close to what we have in all the, these molecular solids. We had 324 mV, so order of 300 mV for the stretching mode. Stretching modes now they are between 100 and 200 mm. So we have 150 mm soft stretching modes. That is much more than you would get from pressure in an insulator. Because if you look at the phonon frequencies, a Raman phonon frequency at 90 GPA before metallization, they are much higher in energy. So the metallization via electron phonon interaction has strongly softened the stretching mode. Second, you have the bending mode. The bending mode are almost at the same energy, of course they are broadened because you have a solid, that you add in the in the, the molecule. So the bending mode they are not been too much soft. Then you can calculate the electron phonon coupling and what is called the phonon line width. So the phonon line width is, is inverse of the typical lifetime of a phonon. And uh, it is proportional to the electron phonon coupling. And the phonon line width is what you see here in red. The larger the, the bar, the larger the electron phonon interaction. And you can see that the bar is invisible at low energy, almost invisible, and mostly here. So most of the electron phonon coupling comes from here, from high e energy minutes. This is what is called the Eliasberg function. And the, the Eliasberg function tells you how much each mode is coupled to electrons. So the integral of this function divided by mega gives you the electron phonon interaction. And the integral is this dash line. So as you can see, uh, sulfur alone at the harmonic level score something like almost one, which is a really honorable electron phonon coupling. Really honorable, it's larger than magnesium dichloride. However, it cannot make 200 k. The, the main difference is given by hydrogen. Hydrogen makes a huge interaction. So you can formalize the things a bit better, 
and you have to be very careful. And the most the biggest difficulty in uh, in uh, first place regulation is to sample that very sharp peak in the density state, so you need very advanced by interpolation techniques. And uh, you end up with a very large electron form interaction, 2.6, one of the largest that I calculated, without having a stable form. But you see that you are going towards a stable form because this form is becoming very low energy. And, so on. and um, which is consistent with a very large, see? We have a one free parameter, so that is uh, the small star, the Coulomb repulsion. But this parameter is very similar between 0.1 and 0.16 with all these materials. So so we, we can also fix uh, this parameter via um, comparison at different pressure, because we assume that it does not change too much. Now, what happens if you include anharmonic effects, which we know that are very important? And indeed, when you include anharmonic effect, the effect is, is, is huge. And in particular, you, uh, if you look, these are the harmonic and this is fully harmonic from the pressure. And you should look in details at the blue stretching mode, you see the stretching model where the one strongly softened are also those that are very harmonic. Yeah. And they are uh, raised in energy. So you see now the center of mass of stretching mode was 158 to 200 maybe, always much lower than the case of the molecule of the insulating or also of the insulating H2S structure, but uh, um, higher. So there is a reduction of the electron form coupling of this one. But the more you see there is no more hybridization between between um, these modes and the south modes. In this case, it has disappeared. And the electron phonon coupling is also different than we show in anomalies. On the contrary, anomalisty has also some effect on bending modes, but they are slightly softer. And if you look at all the details, anomalisty is very non trivial in the system. It's not only a shift of the mode, but also again vector affected by anomalisty. Because it's a very, very anomalic system, as always it is the case with high. In hydrogen, you have to be very careful in trusting calculation without an harmonic quantum effect because they are always important. And the reason why they are important is that when you have a light element, this displacement is very big and it samples also uh, the full protection. Okay. This is very, very important. So, why would, this is why it would be very nice to have a Raman because you see uh, substantial difference, but you can't measure the Raman. <coughs> I skip this, but um, you 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 can also you have to know that you can calculate uh, electron from coupling in the presence of harmonicity, and what you see is that there is a substantial reduction of uh, the electron from coupling, as you can see here, and uh, the superconducting critical temperature is close to experiment. This is not very significant in this case, but what is significant is that the isotope effect is very different in the two cases, and actually I will show you now why. So uh, we did the same thing for, for D, D3S. Right? And D3S uh, has much lower anharmonic effect, still anharmonic effect, but, but lower than the other case. And uh, uh, interestingly, we find this uh, reduced size of effect is 0 0.35. And now the story is uh, somewhat funny because the first uh, publication on element was finding an isotope effect that is uh, 1.0, so from totally unconventional. And uh, so we had our paper in which we said that uh, the isotope effect was supposed to be 0 35 when you include an harmonicity. is of course larger if you do not include an harmonicity, but it's still below 0 0.5. And then, uh, and then uh, the new phase came out, and the isotope effect is indeed 0 0.35. So it's very close to 0 0.35. And this is the comparison of all the approximations. So this is the calculation uh, that we have uh, at the uh, for the H3S phase, this is the calculation for the uh, D3S phase. As you can see, this, this uncertainties are mostly even, you see this, this curve is not smooth, uh, is the difficulties in sampling this very sharp test of states. Uh, it gives you this, this oscillation. And um, mm, uh, then you can see that the IM minus 3M structure has this behavior as a function of temperature, uh, uh, including an harmonic effect, so match fairly well with the uh, experimental behavior. And as you can see here, uh, this is the harmonic calculation on the same phase, and this is the harmonic calculation for the D2S. As you can see, even if you shift them due to the different value of new star, the, 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 the difference between the two is much bigger than experimental. 
The, these are the calculations for the earth and structure, not only done by me, but also other people, so with, with and without harmonies. You see, it's earth and structure are totally different behavior uh, as a function of pressure. So it is somewhat tempting to say that this, this is earth again. And now there are new measurements unpublished, say, showing that this phase actually arrives up to here and then comes down as the other one. So the difference between the, the fact that they come down is essentially a measure of your quantum effects because this is too stable, somewhat to lower pressure than this one because this is heavy. And uh, now it's, temp it's tempting to say that this range of pressure is, 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 is the one of, uh, in which the R3M phase becomes stable, but actually in this range of pressure there are also competing more complicated phases as, as shown by the group of Akashi, of Arita, particularly by uh, Akashi, his main work, maintained his work. So, so it's actually, we don't know what happens here. So now I, I come to conclusion. So uh, what are the main conclusions? So first of all, uh, H2S uh, as a function of pressure decomposed in S plus H3S. Uh, and above 200, if they get above 200, Closer to 250 GPA, you can also get HS2, but this is lower TC, lower in mean, 35 Kelvin, not zero TC, but it's much lower. Than this. And uh, above um, 103 GPA, hydrogen bond semitization of quantum effects stabilize always the um, IM minus 3M phase. Uh, so this explains the different behavior of TC versus pressure. And uh, uh, H3S, uh, we can conclude, is a form mediated superconductor. Uh, which uh, most of superconductivity is sustained by hydrogen. So what we can say is that this has, has been our way to metallize hydrogen without need of going to very high pressure, I mean, to, under GPA, uh, to very high pressure, like the one needed to metallize pure hydrogen. And the second, the, the last interesting thing, maybe is less interesting experimentally, but is it interesting to theoretical, theoretical theoretician, there is now a way to treat an harmonic and quantum effect in a multiple way an efficient way, even for a stable system that it was not actually present before. This is why this work is also interesting, because uh, in proximity of charge density wave instability, all these anharmonic effects are very important, and the charge density of wave instability with very light atom, also quantum effects can be important. This is everything I have to tell you in the taking question. Yes, okay. I have a question about your uh, this new method of anharmonic, um, the harmonic approximation to the anharmonic potential. Do you think that it captures the electron phonon, the real electron phonon interaction? I think that uh, there are two levels of, of complexity. Uh, it captures. Uh, so if you want, uh, uh, if we stay with the electron phonon interaction, uh, it captures, with linear electron phonon interaction, it captures the fact that uh, uh, the uh, phonon frequencies and uh, uh, the phonon eigenvector uh, are affected by the harmonicity and it captures its effect on the electron phonon interaction. However, there is a second possible effect. There are two other possible effects. One effect is that what is uh, the effect on the deformation potential due to harmonicity. This is very difficult to calculate because it requires very high derivative. Okay. So this is, we assume that the harmonic, the deformation potential is harmonic. And then there is a second question, is what is the nonlinear electron phonon coupling? And this is another object even that also is difficult to calculate. And here it's possible that when you, you, you go to 2.0 lambda, you also get nonlinear electron phonon interaction. Everything is possible. This is not captured. Also. Okay. I think that um, uh, this is probably the best that we can do at low temperature with what we have now. Of course, it's not perfect. Okay. More questions? Chemically, okay. hydrogen is a simple system than H2S or H2S or any other thing. But still, the theory has been failed or failing to predict the hydrogen replacement characterization. The hydrogen? Yeah, pure, pure hydrogen. Pure hydrogen. Pure hydrogen. So, what, no, uh, what has been failed? Uh, 
theory has been failing in predicting the metallization pressure. So it's still especially going up. Ah, but this is. So, uh, yeah. like, what is the reason, like, it is successful in this? So, I think that there are two reasons. So, mainly, so now, so, so there are two reasons. One reason is how many structures do you have? Uh, so you can have, uh, for example, you can uh, synthesize very large uh, structures, what I mean with many atoms in the unit cell, and in this case they are very difficult to predict. But this is not the main reason. The main reason is that in order to, to determine when a system is metallic, uh, you know to have a good prediction of the gap in the insulator. That's the functional theory method meters normally uh, underestimate the gap. So it means underestimate also of a factor of two. So it means that normally uh, your pressure is always lower, the metallization pressure, than what you can find in experiment because you, you need to calculate properly the gap. This is special because when you have this transition to either the L3 M phase or I M minus the phase, you are immediately metallic. So you are not metallizing an insulator by applying pressure and staying in the same structure. You get immediately metallic as soon as you stabilize the structure. So it means uh, that uh, if you manage to predict the point at which the structure change, as this is already metallic, and in metals, that's the functional theory works pretty well, uh, then you are here, here, you are done. So if you want that this, this uh, if you want to predict, on the contrary, the metallization of other structure, you probably need to go beyond the function theory, and this is not easy. And this is, my, I think, my opinion for hydrogen. This is the problem of pure hydrogen. Oh, okay. uh, I was just wondering, when you have your integrated phonon density of states, how, in general, how you decompose that into a specific mode character, for example, what you call stretch and band? Uh, this is easy because uh, if you have your phonon density of state, uh, so uh, you can define uh, you can define the, if you want uh, uh, the same object as density of state times uh, the phonon eigen vector, so the, the Cartesian component of phonon eigen vector, modulus square, and then you sum over all the q, sum over q eigen vector, and then delta function of omega minus omega q. Now. If you have the Cartesian component of the eigenvector, you can put to zero those that you don't want. So you can put to zero vibration of sulfur on Z, for example. You can, and then you can calculate the 